welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us from coming to us from the coming to us from way across the pond, and and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way here with his upcoming project, one of us will die. The one and only Titus Villanueva. How are you doing today, man? Or hey, man. Well, today for you, tonight for me. Yeah. Have I mentioned that I hate time zones? I can relate. <laughs> could have been worse. You could have called me in the morning. <laughs> yeah, people all, people often say that they're that they're willing to they're willing to go late, and I'm sitting here going, "How late is late?" Sometimes late might be like nine o'clock. Sometimes late might be the ass end of the night. Oh, for me, it's as long as it's not the morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not a mo not a morning person, I take it. I am not a morning person. Probably, a, probably a few ex, probably a few stro stronger pots of coffee. Oh yeah, uh, it 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 takes a bit of coffee to get me going. Mm -hmm. I usually just use the pinch because I'm not because if I'm because after the pinch, if my if I'm get, dealing with a headache, I'm not thinking about being tired. Ah, you know what? That 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 that's good practice. Mm -hmm. But it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh wow, um, that was that is a long story. My first shtick with role-playing games was attempting to play it in high school with some friends, but we could never really get the schedule right because we were kids and we didn't understand the vast responsibility that came with scheduling. I tried playing it early college. Well, actually, no. It was, it was better than just a try. The first uh, role-playing game I learned was called Cthulhu. I ran it for my sister and a couple of my cousins. Um, we actually got into Call of Cthulhu because we played the Eldritch Horror board game, which uh, we ended up really liking. Um, so I actually started out as a DM. Hardly ever got to play. The first time I played was at... was on... Gary Gygax's birthday in a board game cafe and they were doing this event where they'd play different tabletop games and I got to play D&D &D First Ed with the red box and everything mm -hmm. and that was the first time I rolled a character that was the first time I went on an adventure um, amazing experience, DM was great, he and I became like like friends like lifelong friends after and we've had so many games after that and from that point forward it just kind of took off i uh i i ended up liking it more for the drama than the actual gameplay because i'm an avid video gamer and if i want gameplay and you know power fantasies and you know being building a character to become strong i would i'd just play a crpg <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much how I started out. And I'm guessing that uh, that as the years went on, you experimented with the, with a bunch of different games before starting with this project. Oh yeah, a ton. Um, bit one of the biggest highlight of my DMing career was uh, I played the Game of Thrones RPG by Green Ronin. Mm -hmm. We played a game that ran parallel to the Game of Thrones timeline, and it lasted for two years. And the thing is, I am terrible at running campaigns. Like, I end up forgetting to schedule. It ends up dying out because 
I don't have time. But no, like this one was just so fun that the players would just bug me every week to run for them and they would just be ready with their sheets and everything, which is a dream. I, I think that some DMs die without ever, ever having to experience a campaign with players like that. But uh, yeah, that one ran for two years and I know the bar isn't super high, but I think we had a better ending than the TV show had. Went in a completely different direction, but a lot of the same stuff happened. Um, you probably that... didn't do the and who has a better story than Bram. Oh my god! Uh, actually, it was really funny. Like if you're if you're if you're fond of Game of Thrones lore, uh, we actually did go with somebody who had a better story than Bran. Like we actually went the same route. We went the same route where hey, it's about the narrative because the king is a figurehead but we didn't get bran we actually had uh ashara dane no not not ashara dane we had a there was this targaryen character who was rumored to um not die of old age who a lot of fans were suspecting to be alive during the course of the game and i actually had her come out and i'm like whoa it's actually a person who's witnessed the entire history of westeros they should be the monarch uh, you know, like, well, technically that's also brand, but this one was, I think, developed better. Yeah. Did you did you end up doing the whole, the whole idea of the North being independent? Oh yeah, the North was uh, independent at the end, but still allied uh, with the Crown at the end. I think they ended it with, um, probably not just one kingdom. Oh, I, I, I gotta say, um, I know that it's role play, but a lot of the people who uh, played the game with me were on their own personal politics, anti-imperialist. So they did kind of push Westeros in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. No complaints, though. The story was great. Yeah. So with that, with that in mind... Because I did, I did cover the Game of Thrones RPG a while back, and I had, I had some, I had some issues with it, but it's not, but I didn't have, but it wasn't like it was the worst exper experience. Um, oh, I could go on and on about the issues that game has. The, I think the, I think the big problem that I had, that one of the big problems I had was just too many, um, too many core attributes. For what, it's, yeah. for what it's trying to do, and there was also the whole time I kept. I may have spoiled myself because I had been playing Legend of the Five Rings for years, which is do which, even though it's using a different subject matter, being more this um, Japanese inspired fantasy as opposed as opposed to what Game of Thrones is doing. Um, it ended. I ended up. Perf the advantage that I ended up having with it is a bit tighter of a focus when it came to the attributes. Like, ten full-on attributes in a point-by setup is way too much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way, way too much. It's... It's rulesy. Like, I had to give them, like, almost an hour every time they had to uh, edit their character sheets. I've I've seen have I seen worse offenders? Oh yes. Um <laughs> like any any time I've had to run GURPS is a prime example. Huh. You know, because I of, promise my game isn't like that. <laughs> uh cuz I pr GURPS eventually becomes a cry for help. <laughs> Just because of all the moving parts you have to deal with, but when it comes to the concept of one of us will die, where did the initial idea co come about for this kind of game? Um, damn, you know, going back to Game of Thrones, I I think Game of Thrones was the first big series that I saw that wasn't afraid to kill off characters. And the thing is, it didn't make me hate the story. I read the books, 
um, read the books, uh, watched the show, and the first season where they kill off Sean Bean, big spoiler, I kind of realized it did more for the story than it took away. Like, you know, Ned Stark just became a lasting presence in the entire story after he died. And I kind of realized that death in a story isn't really a... It's it's not a negative thing. Eventually, I got into other stuff like Dune and um, some other content. But I realized that... Um, death may be kind of sad and meaningless in the real world but in a story it is a plot device and I think that other uh, RPGs tend to lack it because one <clears throat> uh, if you've played like Dungeons and Dragons uh, with any group people are always afraid to get their characters killed and I don't blame them because the character creation in D&D is kind of tedious. You're constantly cross-referencing with the player's handbook. And you've chosen their backstory and everything and their experiences. And you don't want to see them die because it's like everything you worked on is just gone. Like that, It's the end. It's the end of the story for that character. And um, I've, I've, had some, I've had some talks about this because that's something that's been brought up in conversation with some of my circles and I do think the concept of of character death is a um is an opportunity is an opportunity to explore that hasn't been touched. I'd I'd say the I'd say the big reason why people are scared of, of the idea of a of character death is the is more the idea of not being able to participate in the narrative going forward. And then I, rem I remember my time playing Rainbow Six Siege and how in that game, just because you may may have gotten killed off in a round doesn't mean you ca doesn't mean you can't participate anymore, because you can still check around the map, you can still spot for everybody else. And I thought, well, well, what? Why not have that kind? Why not have that kind of thing where you can still aid in other people's roles, for instance? Like, you may be dead, but that doesn't mean you're you're out of the game. Yeah. Damn, I love Rainbow Six. Um, I totally get what you mean. And in the, at the same time, when you die in Rainbow Six, you could still be the hero, even if you're dead. I do have a mechanic for that in the game. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but what what would you con what would you consider some of the media that mi that might have been the appendix end for? The uh, for a pet for um one of us will die. Media, like whether oh, whether definitely. it be book, whether it be books, games, films, what what not. Appendix N is kind of a shorthand for inspirational media. I see, I see. Uh, that is an easy thing to answer, and it's pop culture in general. But I got it. I got a lot of it from movies and anime. That's a that's a pretty wide net. It is a wide net. Uh, it's it's mostly because my interests have a wide net, but it's really just if you if you pick up the book itself, the book is just um like before every chapter, I have a quote from a pop culture media, and the stuff there ranges from anime, TV show, movies, uh, punk, pop, metal. And I think a lot of this is just a lot of stuff that I've picked up over the course of my life and I'm just into a ton of things. Like, like it, a, a, a huge ton of things. But like, if I were to throw an even bigger blanket over it, it would be just pop culture in general, things that a lot of people like things that people would know from cultural osmosis like Star Wars or Hunger Games or Attack on Titan like they're not necessarily the same genre but these are things that you would earn from cultural osmosis mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's since given the given the whole thing of one of the one of the party members is a tr is essentially a traitor. I know, I know. For some, they'd probably re they'd probably reference Among Us. I'm not going to do that because that's too easy. <laughs> mm. Because what immediately comes to mind for me is obviously some of the social deduction games like How to Host a Murder, um, Clue, and films like The Thing. Oh, that was another thing. <laughs> that was another thing that I took inspiration from. Thank you for mentioning The Thing. Yeah. Now I always have to clarify the movie because I have because I have I have um some fa I have some people who are enthusiasts of military hardware and you th and when they hear the thing they think of the infamous tank that was used in Vietnam. Where where some where some people said let's take let's take the main gun off of a tank and replace it with six bazookas, and then have a fifty cal rifle as the spotter for the bazookas. Oof. The ar the army looked at that and said, "That is way too much backblast. We we don't want this." Then the marines looked at it and said, "I'll take two, two hundred. Oh lol. Because they didn't care about the backblast. You're sh you're shooting six, and technically it's recoilless rifle, but bazooka sounds better, so I'm going with that. <laughs> yeah. But. The thing as far as far as that first entrance into what would become the Apocalypse trilogy is an interesting beast in its own, in its own right because because of the of just the just the insanity that was in the development of it and the fact that um Carpenter wasn't the first choice for for director. Oh, he wasn't. No, I think he was like the third I think he was like third on the list. But because everybody, every everybody else, they wanted to get, um, ended up turning it down for one reason or another, and he was seen as too indie. He eventually ended up get ended up getting it. There was oh, wow. also there was also the whole thing of Stan Winston almost driving himself insane when it came to making some of the creature effects. Oh, which. Ends up making sense because, um, Winston is the goat when it comes to, uh, when it com when it com when it comes to um creature effects in film. Oh yeah, after that, no doubt. Well, the before before and after, he was more or less the guy when it came to practical effects. And that's why it's interesting that, that 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 kind of thing is brought up, but it goes into that theme of of, betra of betrayal and sub and subterfuge. And one of the things that I enjoyed uh, from the thing was that the betrayal did not come from malice. It really just can like it, I, I like the idea that betrayal can come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you're like oh, what your 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 teammates could be evil, or your teammate could be uh, possessed by uh, could be imitated by a monster. I was playing, oh my god, I was playing, uh, I was playing. I keep forget Lethal Company last night with some of my friends, mm -hmm. and I was, I was hiding. I was just hiding in a. I was hiding in the ship. Uh, this enormous dog monster was outside, and it mimicked the voice of my girlfriend who was on the team. So, like you know, like I'm hiding. I hear the most comforting thing that I could hear because you know, hearing your partner's voice when you're scared is like the most comforting thing you could hear. And I slip up a little bit. I'm like, oh, oh, she's here, and. Uh, the the dog comes out and kills me, which is brilliant because uh, that is how that is how some predators will do you in. Mm -hmm. It did remind me of the thing, and there are scenarios like that in One of Us Will Die. 
I'm really glad you mentioned the thing because it is one of the inspirations for um, some of the scenarios. There's one that's indirectly inspired from the thing called Interstellar Nightmare. And I do have a book coming out after of even more scenarios. And that one will have one that is directly inspired from the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can certainly get I can certainly get the vibe of that. Now, with that in with that in mind, so I did I did see the um ca the character sheet that you're go that you're going with with the you're you refer to it as an archetype system that has a customizable character sheet. Is is it similar in some ways to like a playbook in Powered by the Apocalypse, or is it a different affair? It is very, very, very much inspired by the playbooks in Powered by the Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So, is, like, it, uh, is it a case where each one has where the the core attributes that you're going to be rolling are the same, but the but each of them has a different set of um, a different set of abilities, a different set of skill skills, moves, whatnot? Yes, the core attributes are the same. In fact, there's only three. Um, I call it body, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. There's only three because I don't like having too many attributes. But their abilities will all be different. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that the character's bonuses and disadvantages are determined by the way you answer what I call character questions, which derive from the character's backstory. So your backstory actually determines your in-game mechanic. And I made it as easy as answering questions, uh, filling in the blanks. I do not like cross-referencing uh, players' handbooks. I find it to be a hassle. I like that. I like to have everything just on the sheet itself. It's funner to get newer people on board, I think. And I think that's what we want in tabletop games. We, we want to introduce people to our our hobby and I think it's much funner this way. Yeah. Or you, or you could ha or you could have them go through a TPK and say what and say welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> uh I had a I had a friend do that for me in a <laughs> Wraith Oblivion. Yeah, I've um I've had when when Games Workshop decided to be complete idiots earlier this year, um, I had a bunch of people came to come to my LGS, i.e. local game store, and try out Infinity. And they the problem is they ended up still playing like they were playing um, Warhammer 40k, which meant doing open charges. Oh, no. And if you know how Infinity works, they didn't last because they ended up getting shredded in a few minutes. Understandable. Because one of the th one of the things with with infinity is when you activate a unit, if an opposing unit has line of sight, it gets a free shot in. And since everybody's yeah. got ranged weapons as well as melee weapons in some form, um, t using terrain effectively is key to not getting shot at. Oh um, yeah. Unless unless you're in a vehicle, in which in which case you're get in which case they can they can shoot at you, but you, they're gonna have a hard time doing it depending on the type of vehicle or if you're in one of those tacks which are basically power armor uh, you you can just tank it cuz you're in you're in power armor <laughs> but they decided to do the charge on open ground and th thinking that they thinking that it would work in a similar manner and ended up learning the hard way that that's not how this works yeah I haven't played Infinity, but I've definitely heard about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen this. I've seen a similar, th and of course, whenever I've um, whenever I've run a certain game, I always write out a primer that goes into what someone should expect. I did that with Lex Arcana once, and I've told the story before. But um, I had specifically said this is an investigation-focused game. Do not build a combat-heavy character. I can't stop you if you do. But if you do that, you've got only yourself to blame. Yeah. I I, I know that feeling. 
one person did and was mad at me that there wasn't enough combat scenes, and I'm like, I told you in advance. You are getting no... You are getting no simpy from me. No simpy. But... Now, look, looking through the the sample character sheet you were you had provided me, um, I am curious. Uh, there's a few things I'm curious about the core rules. Now, one is the is the fact that at least one die needs to land on a five or a six. Since I yep. brought up powered by the apocalypse earlier, is there a case where there's some sort of but and effect? You know, like how some. Some effects in PBTA are yes and or no but or vi and vice versa. Yes, uh, there are critical successes and critical failures. Mm -hmm. If all the dice roll on a one, um, if all the dice roll on a one, it's it's a critical failure. That means that the storyteller, DM, well, in this case, the director, has to add an extra complication to the move. Very similar to um, another Powered by the Apocalypse game. Uh, what was it? The Sword, the Crown, and the Unspeakable Power. Yeah. Well, when you said um, another Powered by the Apocalypse game, like you're going to have to be more specific than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what really gets, what really I think is fun is multiple sixes. Two sixes, you get a critical success. That means that you get to. Uh, that means an extra advantage gets added in. Mm -hmm. Three sixes, you get to add. Uh, like two sixes, you narrate the nature of your success, not the DM. Mm -hmm. A lot of the bonuses in the game are basically just fighting over narrative control from the other players and from your DM. All right, I, I can For... get that. Um, the um. I, Houses of the Blooded had a, and um, and its spin and its spinoffs had something similar. Oh yeah, yeah. I've heard, I've I've actually been compared to Houses of the Blooded before, even if I've never played it. Yeah, it's uh oh, the 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 only the only um comparison I I could say is both of them are used is the whole. Um, fighting over narrative control and both of them using d6s because things because um, houses of the blooded and and um, think and things like blood and honor it's all about a rule of 10 ah you get it you get at least ten, you get at least 10 then you have narrative control you get more tens then you then you can add then you can add material since a lot of it is based on a lot of it is based on the ra the roll and keep and raise setup that was in Legend of the Five Rings, because Wick had worked on L five R at one point. Even though, um, don't ask him about him, about the void magic he did back in the day, because I'm pretty sure that's a sore spot given all the crap he got about how OP that those spells were. But yeah, when. But on the character sheet, it talks about advantage one in some places. Is that just adding an extra dice to those to those particular rolls, or does advantage or disadvantage mean something different? No, no, you add. Oh no, no, it's not adding a die. Advantage means you re-roll a success. Disadvantage means you re-roll a failure. I guess it's the same as uh, re-rolling a die. I actually kind of got that because at the time I was playing Warhammer Kill Team, mm -hmm. and uh, the last. Uh, version of it, I, I quite enjoyed it. So I do like the idea of being able to re-roll your dice and having that as a resource. So is it is it re-rolling aid? Is it re-rolling aid dice, or is it re um rolling it rolling a success to potentially add another, i.e., exploding dice? It's re-rolling one die. Like for example, if you have advantage one, one die comes on a failure, you can re-roll that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have disadvantage, and, uh, a successful die, you've got to re-roll. Yeah. And you are collecting uh, fives and sixes because your degree of your success is by the amount of fives and sixes you have. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you get to the combat portion of the book, you really only do damage in sixes. And this might seem weird when you look at it uh, from the get-go, but when you watch actual combat, 
or when you've been in a I mean I haven't been in an actual fight but my other hobby mm -hmm. is uh Hima uh historic and historical European martial arts mm -hmm. and most of the time not ev most of the time the exchanges don't end with somebody getting hit most of the time the exchanges um come with somebody strikes the other person blocks that person strikes the other person blocks they both escape because they don't want to risk anymore because in in some categories in Hema they actually deduct you for getting hit and they also deduct you for getting doubles so you do not want to get hit in a fight so naturally a lot of the time they're just stalemate so and your goal in a fight isn't actually to kill the other person your goal in a fight always top priority is to defend yourself so if you roll for combat and only the player rolls in combat if you roll for combat if you succeed you've defended yourself you don't take any damage you can choose what to do next after that you can run you can try to talk them down or whatever but if you succeed and there's a six it's only the six that actually damages your opponent mm -hmm. and so far through the playtests i've actually found it to be quite an effective way to do combat because a lot of the time i think a lot of new uh tabletop uh i don't know what else to call it, tabletop virgins um, really prefer to get into the swashbuckling action of it all rather than, you know, having to look through the book all the time and being told what certain numbers mean or having to do too much math. I do not like math. Yeah, I, th uh, I, think, it, I think it comes down to um, background. Like if, some, if somebody's yes. coming into this from more of a theatric or, te or television or, ev or even a weeb, kind of perspective I think they'd be a little bit immersed a little bit averse to that but if they're coming in from more of a um, more of a video game perspective they might they might actually get on with that a bit easier um, oh yeah I've, definitely this not to put myself on a pedestal again but this is why I never why I years ago stopped doing um, out of 10 scores for when I reviewed stuff it was and it shift and shifted it to who would I recommend this to, and why? Oh, hey, that's pretty good. Oh, I like that. Is I, I there's a the approach that I always t I always tell people is that it's like a tailor. You know how a tailor is go is going to is going to make a suit that's fitted specifically to you, which is why they're going to be measuring you out for that suit. It's the same principle. Uh, it's not it. Games can be for anybody, but not every game is going to be for everyone. And that's true. I believe that. Like I've, and usually, usually the games that get instead of a um instead of a out of ten, I do a tier setup that I blatantly ripped off of from Chuck Sonnenberg. Um, starting at the top is strongly recommended. At the bottom is avoid. What determines how high up on the pole you end up getting is how many asterisks I have to add. Like if I have to add um, more asterisks, you're lower on the totem pole. Oh, that makes sense. One of my more recent ones was um, Traveler fi was Traveler Five, and I had put that as avoid because of the way the way everything was presented. It wasn't the math itself; it was how it was shown to me. And the fact that it couldn't quite get to the point and was so dry, it reminded me of that um, owner's manual for your car that you don't read. Oh boy, yeah, 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 I hate those. That is one of the reasons why I don't like having too many rules. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, a lot of, and I often bring that up because a lot of people will do the will give me the whole spiel about, oh, I don't, I don't like too many rules, and I'm, or that, or that, or too many rules bad, less. Little, as little rules as possible, good, and that I don't think people should treat it as a binary. Oh, yeah, it's very it's nine times out of ten it's all it's all about the execution because I look at say fate. 
Fate is a very rules light game, but I'm not a, I'm not a fan of how it presents itself because it builds itself on that aspect system, but doesn't do a good job at explaining what a good or bad example of an aspect would be. Mm. And when an aspect could be just about it could be literally anything, that specificity I think is re I think is required at least to give people some guidance. Instead yeah. of just throwing them in the deep end and tell and tell them to paddle. That's I understand that. But a, a lot of people treat it as as if it's this um binary when really when reality it's a pendulum. Whether you go too far to the left side or too far th to the right way, the problem is you've gone too far. Yeah. But moving moving past that, since we talk since you talked a bit about combat. Um, and I, I do, I do see in the sheet that you have both HP and DP. Um, yeah. HP, I can figure out. I mean, I wasn't born yesterday, but what exactly is DP meant to entail? Oh, DP is destiny points. Um, destiny points, uh, you, in other RPGs, they're used to like, you know, stem the tide. Mm -hmm. um, in this game, destiny points. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> destiny points basically allows you um, more control over the story. The only way you get destiny points in this game are through some character mechanics unique to some characters. Some characters are better at generating destiny points than others. Uh, completing your story milestones also nets you destiny points. I'll talk about story milestones later. Mm -hmm. But basically what a destiny point lets you do is it lets you, one, lets you add a die to a roll. Uh, two, it lets you add a story element that benefits your character. Like, for example, uh, my favorite example to use is the um the original Disney Mulan adaptation where where uh, the Huns are riding towards her and she only has one cannon. And basically what happens is if this if she were playing one of us will die, her player would have said, okay, I aim the cannon and can I use a destiny point to say that the mountain is at an avalanche point. And the DM would say, yes, fine. You use a destiny point, the mountain is at an avalanche point. Okay, I aim the cannon at the mountain, not at the Hun leader. And then she rolls critical success. The, uh, the cannon hits the mountain and the Huns are uh, wiped out by the resulting avalanche. That That's what a destiny point is for. And the third and most important use for a destiny point is um, if you are dead, a destiny point will allow you to take control as the DM for one scene. Mm -hmm. Which is why like some players are like, what? I get to be the storyteller? So... Um, when they're dead, that's kind of what they're waiting for. And what's really fun is, if it's the traitor who dies, <laughs> and he uses the destiny point to become the narrator, uh, and just makes everything even more hostile, that that's still fun. Because it's kind of like how, you know, in a movie, after they've killed the traitor, stuff still seems to just get worse and worse, almost as if the traitor's pulling the strings from beyond the grave. Mm -hmm. like, Plus, you've had, you have the lot. cliche of load-bearing villains. Yeah. And also the cliche of, you know, your dead loved ones also helping you from beyond the grave. Like, uh, you know, things happening. You're like, oh, God, he's still watching over us. In this case, they are. Mm -hmm. Again, the the way to ease the weight of um of character death in this is to, well, li well, lighten the load so that people can still participate, even if their character's gone. Yeah. And, uh... 
it, it it's very much uh similar to how Rainbow Six does it, where you're kind of still helping them from beyond, mm -hmm. or working against them. Yeah. Oh, um, I will note that I'd also cited as a potential example, as a potential idea of using the whole physical and spectral relationship that Raziel has in the Soul Reaver games. Oh, no, he, he runs out of. I have not played those. Um, I always recommend those two. Pe to, I always recommend the Legacy of Kane series to just about anybody I can. Um, Raziel is a wraith. He okay. is, and his natural his natural form is in the spiritual plane. But if he but he is able to will himself to have a physical body. If that physical body takes too much damage, he shifts back into the spectral plane and has to recover his energy by absorbing souls. Of course, th of course there's still threats even within that like uh, like um like uh, like the souls of vampires or or worse things down there that could take him out in the spectral plane and if he takes too much damage there, it's game over. But there's still again, it's the idea of you run out of HP but you're not fully dead, you can still come back. It's just you have to fight to get it to get it back. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that's one thing that could be done with with this system, but just adding to th that whole lightening the load when it comes to character death. Yeah, definitely. Oh, but on the opposite spectrum, I also wanted this game to make death feel heavy. I actually think that a lot of games, both video games and tabletop games, uh, they tend to trivialize death sometimes. Where in the real world, death is something that you know ruins people's lives. It's it's a turning point for so many stories, so many people's stories, and it's tragic. No matter who it happens to, it's always tragic. Like, it's always never the best outcome. Even if it's to a person you want to die, like, y even in stories, when the person deserves to die, like, them dying sometimes feels like a denial of justice somehow. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, like, yeah. I both wanted to lighten... I oh, no, no, no. I got it. I got it. I wanted to lighten the load for the player but I wanted it to feel heavy for the characters. Yeah, I can, I think, I can get yeah. that. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, I know that this is fairly, er, fairly early uh, in, de in development. Oh, actually, I'm done. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I, guess I, I guess I had carried that assumption based on the notes you had, you had um, sent. But one of the thing, but based on the way things are described, it sounds it sounds like this is built more on a idea than on a particular um, storytelling genre, for lack of a better term. Is that accurate, or am I or am I reading into things? Well, if there is a genre, the genre would be tragedy, tragedy in the most classical sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I mean by that is this isn't necessarily a fantasy game, necessarily a science fiction game, so ah, and no. that that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. It's uh, it's multi-genre, multi-setting, yeah. all tragedy. And given the, given that, and given the specific theme of tragedy, do you plan on putting in um, advice on how to do on how to do a tragic campaign in the GM section of the full book? Oh yes. And as a follow-up um, to that, do you plan on putting in some example? Um, I guess I guess example, for lack of a better term, modules for for it to represent that this is not necessarily leaning into um, contemporary or fa or fantasy or science fiction exclusively. Oh yeah, um, the game itself comes with like the the core book already comes with five. Um, it already comes with five modules. 
Um, and what's interesting about the modules is you start each module with five character questions. And for, I think, three out of five of the modules, the character question is, what is the setting? Because the modules actually take place. Um, the modules themselves are stories. They're not settings. They have the skeleton of the story. They've got characters. They've got rising actions. They've got climax. They have. They each have three acts to them. But I do not describe the setting. That's because the first question is uh, supposed to be answered by the players. For mm -hmm. example, there's one module called uh, Embers of War. I've had several char I've had several players go. Oh, I want to be in. I want this to be World War Two, so we can shoot Nazis. And so they did. Same story. But it was in World War Two. Oh, I want this to be. Oh God, this one time, one guy just decided I'm going to set this during the Spanish colonization of the Philippines, and I'm like, oh, that is so niche. You are so lucky. I listened in history class. <laughs> Otherwise, I would not be able to DM this. But I did, and it became same story, same adventure, same three acts. But the theme was completely different. It became a, it became a theme of uh, you know cultural identity and um, what it really means to belong to a tribe or a nation and what the difference is between the two. There is another... Like, I even have one coming up. I, I started writing it last night. It's set in the court of King Arthur. And even that, actually, even that still has the question where is this where and when is this set and the reason for this is because if you enjoy shakespeare the scripts are the same you've been using the same script since the 15th century but so many different productions you've seen hamlet in a post-apocalypse you've seen romeo and juliet in the modern day you've seen julius caesar in uh, in an African dictatorship, I think that, of course, there are some scenarios where the setting is kind of already kind of non-negotiable and set already. But most of the time, I do love it when the players are allowed to choose their settings. There's one called um, Shadow of the Dragon, where mm -hmm. the players, where it's a one shot and the players are saving a city from a dragon. I've had it played in a classic fantasy and another where it was played on Mars and they just built the Mars colonies and lo and behold, there is a space dragon that is going to destroy it and the players must find a solution to that. So it's, again, same script, different settings. Mm -hmm. And... With that in with that in mind, oh, what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count of the project? Total page count. Right now, the complete book is around a hundred and thirty pages. It might get longer, mm -hmm. but so far, it's it's a hundred and thirty pages long. I can I can certainly get that. And do you have a do you have a release date that you have pl planned f to release like a quick start before the full book? Um I actually plan on releasing a sort of semi quick start. I mean, I'm not going to call it a quick start because it actually is going to have more content than a normal kick start would have. Mm -hmm. Um That'll come out on Drive Through RPG, and uh, the book itself. I'm hoping to release it some point quarter three next year. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, just you know, fingers crossed. I'm I'm actually still trying to figure out how I'm gonna go about the launch. Mm -hmm. This is my first title, yep. and. I'm not quite sure how to publish an RPG, to be honest. This is the hardest part. Yeah, if if, if it's any consolation, I'd say most people who are publishing their own their own stuff have no idea what they're doing. Yeah, which is why whenever I ask people, they don't know either. 
Yeah, it's it doesn't seem to be something that you can, that can be told. Rather, yeah. rather, it seems to be something that pe that you just have to um have have to have to just wing it until you eventually get it get it right by throwing a bunch of things at the wall. Yeah, I mean, right now. I'm just trying to get as much exposure for the game as I can, which is why I was so happy you agreed to uh, talk to me about this. Mm -hmm. Well, I do. Doing this kind, doing this kind of thing is par is all part of my particular um, crusade. But I will, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it comes around when it when it gets closer to release, and that's as that's. As good enough of a re of a reason that that there ever will be to try and do a return. <laughs> oh, I would love to do a return. Mm -hmm. um, hell, do you ever like? Uh, do you ever do live plays? Um, I do have I do have my own actual play. We're currently going through Emberwind. Yeah, and... because I'm, I'm I'm happy to run a one shot live play. Oh, by the way, this game is a one shot game. Yeah, I fig um... I figured that it was <laughs> built for it was built for one shots. And there's there's a handful of um, TTRPGs out of Japan that are skewed more towards one shots than full campaigns. Yeah, this is one of them. Uh -huh. So that and I and based on the way things are going with it and what you've described, I could see someone potentially using it for multiple campaigns but I can't see those multiple campaigns going you know months long months long like some games will definitely not yeah, although it's... I will say that the core book comes with one campaign mm -hmm. it's uh of course it's an HP Lovecraft campaign mm -hmm. uh because HP Lovecraft is public domain and I can use the content mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it's called uh, The King and the Sultan's Son and it's about this conflict between two elder gods and their cults that I will not name and it takes place over several points in history and every session one character will die so it's really just a uh, it gives you this perspective of a bigger world and we are just there to die in it. Mm -hmm. Which is how you feel when you play H.P. Lovecraft games. Yeah. Remember, sand check. Sand check. Oh, funny thing about sand checks. Um, H.P. and sanity are the same thing here. Um, because health points aren't just physical health points they're physical and mental health points one of the thing one of the reasons i did this was because you are getting hurt and getting insane pretty much at the same time and the way that i differentiate it is there is an injury system and the injury will debuff a certain attribute. So if you're taking more mental damage than physical damage, your injury will uh, triple your mind stat. If you're taking more physical damage, your injuries will cripple your physical stat. So that's kind of how I went about it. That way you don't have to track two numbers for both health and sanity. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think that it goes well together because it is easier to drive somebody who is physically hurt insane than it is to drive somebody who is physically healthy insane. I think that sanity and physical health go hand in hand. It's just like how when you go to a when you go to a doctor and you say, Doctor, I'm depressed, and the doctor says, Okay, it seems you've got depression from all these uh you know, from all these tests we've run. I'm going to have to ask you to, one, take these pills, two, go to psychotherapy, but also exercise every day and eat properly because physical and mental health are actually tied together. And I actually think that, you know, I get that word out by having HP and sanity being a singular, uh, a singular 
stacked. Also, it makes the character sheet smaller and less tedious. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will, I will, like I said, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Yeah. But with that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often oh, say sure. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I like that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But Happy until holidays, then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!